Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it's great to be here at a SBIA, very historical institution for Muslims here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we pray that Allah continues to bestow his blessings upon the community as it grows and expands. Inshallah, soon you'll be running out of space. The MCC, they went from place to place and they got their dream building and now they need another building. And, and so these are called good problems because they're indicative of growth uh, in our community. Well, alhamdulillah, uh, tomorrow, as we all know, is the 20th year since the attacks of September 11th, 20, uh, 2001. And those uh, attacks, no matter what, who you believe did it. So you could believe it was Bin Laden and his crew. You believe it was the Mossad, CIA inside job. Whatever you believe, it was terrible. And it was a crime. And it has affected the world. And in a sense, in many unprecedented way, or ways, it's led to two very destructive wars uh, from this country. One which has uh, ended a little earlier, one phase of the war in Iraq and Syria ended, and but a new phase began. The new phase is aerial bombardment or what they're mentioning now for Afghanistan, war from over the horizon by robotic drones. And it's, uh, it's ironic that the last act of that phase of the war was and a, a, a family of 10 people, seven children being wiped out by a Hellfire missile sent from a Predator drone. And I say that just to say that's the opening salvo and the new phase of the war in Afghanistan. And we pray that Allah has mercy on the Afghan people and that there's peace and stability that our sisters are able to continue and the pursuits that they were involved in. And while the spirit of the Sharia uh, brings great blessings to all men, women, children, safety, security, peace, and unity, inshallah, to the great Muslim land of Afghanistan, home of so many of our great scholars and personalities, very beautiful and tough, resilient people. So may Allah Ta'ala bless them. But, but those two wars and over a million dead Muslims all are rooted in the events of September 11th. And that's about as controversial as I'm going to get. Someone said, don't be controversial because it's a, it's a time of remembrance for the American people. I found that strange because I thought we're, we're the American people also. As if, you know, it's us and the American people. And that, that argument, my dear brothers and sisters, that argument is old and it prevents us from having those difficult conversations that's going to move this country forward. That's what they said after the September 11th attacks. No, don't get too controversial, don't talk about American foreign policy because the American people are mourning. It's like, well, that means I'm mourning too. So I'll be affected by whatever anything is said. So it's, it's, it's inexcusable that we can't have that conversation. It's inexcusable that anything that would go against the false narrative of make America great again. And I, again, why a false narrative? Because it's either great for all of us or it's great for none of us. And great again implies Native American genocide. So it wasn't so great for the Native people. It implies slavery and all of its brutality. The African American community it implies here on the West Coast. Uh, Chinese uh, being hunted down like dogs, 18 killed in one day in one of these West Coast cities, I forget which one, maybe Portland, Oregon, 
it implies Japanese internment. And so it's either great for all of us or it's great for none of us. Definitely it's been good. There's no doubt about that. But we want to see our country be great. And unless and until we're able to have those difficult conversations, unless and until we're able to recognize that there's more than one story making up the American experience, we won't be great. We'll be good, but we won't be great. And we want to see our country be great. Uh, there are many effects we can look at uh, on the American Muslim community itself as a result of uh, the uh, attacks on 9-11. Uh, one thing, it, there, there are things we can look at in a positive sense and there are things we can look at in a negative sense. And one of the positive th things is that it, it led to many people who were involved in, in Dawa and Islamic work, stepping back and examining the effectiveness of their approach. So a, a lot of the rhetoric was delusional. And so we had, you had groups talking about Khilafa here in America. This was Khalif, California, Khalifa, California. And things like that. And without taking into any account just the difficulty of major societal change, look how hard it was for the Prophet Sallallahu and a pre-modern society with a, a relatively small population to effect change against the Arabs as the messenger of Allah. So how difficult would it be in a major, complex, massive country, complicated country like the United States to affect meaningful societal change with no media resources to speak of, no political capital at all to speak of, uh, no means to affect the popular culture to speak of, and we could go down the list. And so September 11th, in a, in a sense, was a wake-up call for many people and helped, uh, I include myself, some of us to reassess what it really, really takes to change a society for the better. It's easy to change it for the worse. We see uh, the consequences of many calculated efforts to change the country for the worse coming to fruition. And it's not just uh, on, the, on the side of the right wing. We could point to Trump and the forces that produce Trump. And most importantly, the forces that produce the people who would vote in large numbers for a figure like Donald Trump. And we need look no further than the Quran. Allah Ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ نُوَلِّي بَعْضَ الظَّالِمِينَ بَعْضَ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Thus do we put some oppressors over others because of what the people themselves have earned. So as a society, we, we earned Donald Trump. And so many of us, including Muslims, uh, some Muslims, are, are given to vulgar speech. So when someone like a Trump comes along with the vulgar language and boorish behavior, yeah, I like that guy. That guy got my vote because he's just like me. And uh, we were talking earlier, uh, more relevant to the topic, uh, Trump in a certain extent, to a certain extent, is a product of 9-11. And that's one consequence of 9-11 and that, that, that divide between those who want to fight a war on terror and those who want to take a more reasoned and balanced and just approach to the problems that were seen as producing those events. 
And so that divide grew and grew and grew as the brutality, the torture, the wars got more and more uh, entrenched into the national psyche. The divisions became further and further entrenched until you get the severe polarization that culminated not with Trump's election, but with Trump's exit. Where the polarization really came to a head to such an extent that half of the country says Trump should be in jail for citing an insurrection and half of the country says how could you dare accuse Trump? He didn't do anything. That was a peaceful rally. And Muslims are all interwoven with that because for the first time in our history, coming out of September 11th, anti-Islam became a significant plank in the platform of, a, of one of the two major political parties, anti-Islam. And anti-Islam as a policy you're all familiar with the recent confessions of the FBI agent who, and they were spying at Zaytuna, then Zaytuna Institute, they infiltrated, and he was so outraged about how the FBI was transformed for, from a law enforcement agency into an intelligence agency set up to spy on Muslims, set up to turn a blind eye to the demonization of Muslims. Formerly, the FBI was fighting against organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. How many of you saw the movie Black Klansmen? MashaAllah. Right? You know, the law enforcement, enforcement is infiltrating the Klan. That was a, at a local level, but this was happening at a federal level. And so as a law enforcement agency, it was turned into an intelligence agency to spy on the Muslim community out of the mistaken belief that you have sleeper cells or working for Al-Qaeda embedded in American society and they had to be weeded out. And the only way to weed them out was to use the kind of uh, intelligence and counterinsurgency tactics that are used against foreign countries, but to use those against our own citizens. And that's taken a toll in some segments of the community. Uh, recently, some of you probably saw the, the suicide report that was featured on NPR. How many of you saw that? Uh, American Muslims, I don't know which American Muslims they talk to, are twice as likely as members of other co religious communities to commit suicide. And when the main driver that kept coming up over and over again was Islamophobia. And Islamophobia in its uh, current iteration comes directly out of 9-11. It was an opportunity for these groups to capitalize on the national fear and the hysteria resulting from those attacks to gain the financing necessary to traumatize large swaths of our community. You can't do that easily and you can't do that cheaply. But in the environment created by 9-11, people willing to pay for it. And you've seen the reports from CARE from our very own Bay Area, UC Berkeley, Zaytun Alish, Dr. Hatham, Bezian, uh, the, the studies of just how much money was being spent by these organizations to uh, spy on the Muslims, to incarcerate Muslims, uh, the initial drag nets to uh, deport Muslims. And so the community uh, uh, aspects uh, and of our community were traumatized. May Allah uh, give us tawfiq and may Allah uh, help us to deal with this climate. So here we're going to shift gears because we could talk all night about what went wrong. We could talk all night about the policy implications, we can talk all night about the impact on Muslims, the radicalization of some of our youth comes out of 9-11. It was a, a natural reaction, many young people are rebellious. And if an innocent person is told like, you're a criminal, you're a terrorist, you're gonna have some that say, okay, if you want me to be a terrorist, I'm gonna show you what a terrorist is. It's sort of a human reaction. 
And so that comes out of 9-11. So you have Americans going overseas and joining uh, Al-Qaeda, going overseas, joining ISIS, or going to join some group in Pakistan, uh, some uh, Jaysh al-Muhammad or this or that, uh, Jaysh al-Qayyaba. This is a natural reaction for some people, especially young people who are very idealistic. And when those ideals are shattered, uh, some people reconstruct an idealistic vision in less than desirable ways. And so we could talk about all of that. But what I want to do is shift gears and, and to just talk about how the original Islamic community, the community of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as captured in the Quran and the Sunnah, how did they deal with the climate that they faced, the climate of hatred, the climate of fear. And so Islamophobia, fear. And the, the term is extremely debatable. Because a phobia is an irrational fear. Okay? But if, if you see people who are captured in their most barbaric, you see, oh, here's the Taliban they're taking. Oh, you see a guy with hair all over the place with a turban on his head, hair flying everywhere, face scowled up with an AK-47. If you're scared of that, that's a rational fear. That's not a phobia. <laughs> so, be that as it is, the, the, the uh, climate is one that's driven by fear. And the, the, the Quraysh, one of their objectives was to instill fear in the hearts of the Muslims through the torture of the Muslims, the persecution of the Prophet himself. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to exploit the power differential that existed between the Muslims and the Quraysh. What, what got them through that? One thing that got them through that were a reminder exactly what it means to be a believer. And we need to be reminded in our day, in our time, in the post 9-11 environment, we're still believers. And what does it mean to be a believer in the face of fear? So if there's a verse in the Quran that reminds us of that exact thing. And so this is after uh, two verses before that. Uh, which is relevant in explaining this verse. Those who the people said that all of the forces are gathering against you. Right? This is the post 9-11 environment. The, the Christian right is gathering against you. The Zionists are gathering against you. The, the clan and the skinheads and the Aryan nation, you're the new enemies. They're all gathering against you. They're not worried about African Americans and Jews anymore. They want Muslims. They said all of these forces are gathering against you. Fear them. Fazadahum imana. It only increased their faith. Why did it increase their faith? Because when they realized all the forces are gathering against you, we can't go to this tribe. They're joining the Quraysh. We can't go to that tribe. They're joining the Quraysh. We can't go to this. We can't go to that. The only one we can turn to is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they turn to Allah with sincerity and total dependence on Allah, it energizes their faith. 
It restored their faith. It renewed their faith. It strengthened their faith. And this is the first step for us, dear brothers and sisters. The first step for us is to strengthen our faith because we are a faith community. And if not, we are nothing at all. If not a faith community, we're nothing at all. And as the faith erodes in the face of fear, in the face of, in, uh, of envy, in the face of arrogance, in the face of superiority, then we end up like other people, worse. So we'll end up with suicide rates like people who have no faith. We'll end up with divorce rates like people who have no faith. We'll end up with young people running away from religion like the young people in other communities are running away from religion. Because faith is our foundation. And so the first thing that allowed that community to overcome that climate of fear, that climate of persecution that led to the two migrations to Abyssinia, to Ethiopia, and then the great migration to Medina. It was faith. And that increase in faith as opposed to a decrease was rooted in their turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they realized there's nowhere else to turn. And so as we Muslims, our community realizes there is nowhere else to turn. A lot of people think you turn to the left, the Democratic Party, but as soon as you stand up and not follow them, they'll, they'll be just as anti-Muslim as the Republicans. You can bank on it. If you say I'm a Muslim and I, 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 I really appreciate your environmental policies because we have a real climate crisis in the west coast with the droughts and the fires the east coast with the hurricanes and the rain and the floods I appreciate that but as a Muslim I can't get down with the LGBTQI plus agenda see how long they'll like you then and so what the Muslims do compromise our principles where I am down with the agenda Okay, good Muslim, you're acceptable. But manifest your Islamic values and see how, see how far you get. The point is we're people of faith and it is our faith that will pull us through. And our faith will be increased when we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ways great and small. To re, 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 reconnect with the Qur'an. Not just reading it, reciting it. It's beautifully recited in the Maghrib prayer and here in the introduction to this talk. But reading it, the translation in a, a language that you understand. So that the meaning begins to shape your consciousness. There's, there's tremendous benefit in reading Qur'an in Arabic, but if you don't understand the Arabic language, that recitation will uplift your soul. That recitation will bring comfort to your heart. But that recitation will not give you an understanding of the rich philosophical, ethical, intellectual heritage that's rooted in the Qur'an, in the Qur'anic message rather. So we have to get in touch with the message. That's what increases our, our faith because the message connects us to Allah Sallallahu and his, Allah Ta'ala and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have to learn to cry. For many of us, our tears have dried. And many of us, our eyes, our hearts have become so cold that they cannot communicate a message to our eyes to shed tears. We have to soften our hearts. How do we soften our hearts? 
Verily, the remembrance of Allah brings tranquility to the heart, and the tranquility comes through the softening of the heart. And that renders our hearts more receptive to the message. And that receptivity translates, what is the heart of the message? What is the dominant theme of the Quranic message? I'll give you a clue. Every chapter starts with it except one. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Mercy. Mercy. Mercy is at the heart of the Quranic message. Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin. A mercy to all the world. Mercy is at the heart of the Quranic message. And when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was shedding tears after the the death of his son Ibrahim and another occasion, the death of a child amongst the uh, Sahaba. Uh, the name escapes me right now. And some of the can companions said, what's this, O Messenger of Allah? You're the Messenger of Allah, you're crying? He said, these tears are mercy, which Allah has placed in the heart of his merciful servants. And so we have to soften our hearts. And when our hearts are softened, they become more merciful. And when they become more merciful, they become the, uh, the, the conduit that connects to the all-merciful. Arahimuna yarhamuhum rahman The merciful people are the ones the all-merciful will show mercy to. Arahimuna yarhamuhum rahman and so these are the things that we have to do, and these things will open our hearts. These things will be the foundation for our faith increasing. We have to move beyond fear. So they 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 connected with Allah Ta'ala and they placed their trust and their dependency on Allah Ta'ala because all the hosts that were gathering against them, they couldn't turn to them. They're all gathering against you, so there's no one for you except Allah. And so they fled to Allah. Allah, flee to Allah. And in fleeing to Allah, they realized this is the source of our trust. This is the source of our salvation. This is the source of our uh, of our escaping our condition as the next sentence affirms. And they said, Allah suffices us, what an excellent one to entrust our affair to. And so, brothers and sisters, when we do those things necessary to strengthen our faith, and then when on that basis, we turn to Allah and we acknowledge that Allah is the most excellent for us, excellent one for us to entrust our affair to, then our burden will be lifted. The fear will be gone. The load will be lighter. The, the confidence in our religion and our community will be stronger. And we'll begin to do those great things that those who preceded us, do, uh, they did. One of the lessons from the aftermath of 9-11 that we should always reflect on is that it wasn't the end of the world. This large blessing for the Muslim community, did it happen before or after 9-11? Happened nine afterwards. The climate wasn't so anti-Muslim that Muslims couldn't do this. Zaytuna College did it happen before, or after nine eleven? After nine eleven, and you can go down the list. Sisters are still wearing hijab, and there might be an isolated incident here or there. But sisters, you've been. Attack lady, anyone throw, throw anything at you lately? Tried to pull your scarf off? 
And so this, this lesson, brothers and sisters, is critically important. 9-11 was not the end of the world. And I say that to say this. Those who preceded us, they faced situations that very well could have led to them saying, this is the end of the world. When the Mongol hordes swept across the heartlands of Islam, leaving millions of people dead, stacking up the, the, the heads and pyramids when they left the town or village to, to strike fear into the hearts of any survivors that might see it. Did that destroy Islam? It did not. Why didn't it destroy Islam? Because those people who survived, they had faith. They had so much faith that they could look those Mongol conquerors, the descendants of Genghis Khan and his children, he could, they could look them in the eye and they could say, you need Islam. After their lands, their villages have been decimated. You need Islam. And so they never lost confidence in their religion. They never doubted in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result, within two or three generations, they brought those conquerors into Islam. And a lot of you are Muslims to that, are, are witness to that. Because you have the very name of those conquerors. You're all Khans. <laughs> so if on those circumstances they could retain their religion, if under those circumstances they could have so much confidence in their religion that they can bring the people who conquered them into that religion. What excuse do we have under the circumstances we're confronted with? What circumstances, uh, what excuse do we have not to have confidence? What excuse do we have to blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What excuse do we have to be committing suicide? What excuse do we have to be filled with fear? And a verse later, where is that fear coming from? That is Satan. He instills the fear of his dupes into you. Fear them not. Rather fear me if indeed you are believers. Goes back to faith. If indeed you are believers. And so brothers and sisters, after this 20 year period of challenges, hardships, difficulties, struggles, let us return to our faith with confidence. Let us return to a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us return to the tranquility and the peace and the calm that emanates from a heart that's in touch with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us return to the remembrance of Allah. Let us fill our homes with the remembrance of Allah and all of its manifestations with Quran, awrad, adqar, awrad, I mentioned that. Fill, let, let these fill our homes. Let us come to the masjid to learn, to be in communion with our brothers and sisters, to, to show people that we are forging on, that we are still here, that we're not going anywhere, and that we will be a great community. We started with greatness, make America great again, and we'll end with greatness. We can contribute to making America great, not again, for the first time. Because as a community, we are multiracial. We have our issues, but we're a community. You come, 
you see people from all backgrounds. You see African-American converts, Euro European-American converts. You see increasingly Latino converts. You see South Asians. You see Central Asians. You see Arabs. You see all people, Africans, Senegalese, Sudanese, all gathered together and brought together into one family, the family of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And this can teach our country that brotherhood and sisterhood is possible. We see our community with relatively small numbers, but doing great things in terms of charity, assisting. How many millions of dollars are raised from our community? for organizations like Islamic Relief and Helping Hands and Penny Appeal and this, this one and that one, just to provide relief for Muslims and people increasing in this country. Islamic Relief is in, uh, in New Orleans. They were there after Katrina. They were there after the tornadoes in Kansas and the Midwest during the tornado season and showing people Muslims are extremely charitable, extremely charitable. And in an age where someone like Ayn Rand can be a best-selling author who advances a philosophy that altruism is an evil and vile characteristic that one should avoid. That's the heart of her philosophy. Altruism is bad to think of others before thinking of yourself, to prioritize others before prioritize your own interests is bad. This is called ethar. This is called sadaqah. This is called zakat. This is again at the heart of Islamic teachings. And at a time when many Americans are moving away from that, our community can demonstrate that this is still a living, viable approach to life. We can teach so many lessons. Yes, we have problems, but alcoholism isn't one of them. Uh, last year or the year before the al global alcoholism study, how many of you saw that? All countries plagued by alcohol, all Western nations, countries where alcoholism is 1%. Pakistan, Bangladesh. So you have some Western educated, deluded people having their petty, worthless parties, drinking alcohol and acting like they're Brits. But the overwhelming majority of the people, 99% of the people, those out in the villages, up in the mountains, there's no alcohol in their lives. This is something we can show and demonstrate and contribute to making this country great, giving priority to others. You know, what, what's driving the, the right-wing movement towards heightened degrees of xenophobia, fear of strangers, heightened degrees of racial-based exclusion? A lot of it is just selfishness, anti-immigrant sentiments. If you read Arlie Hochschild, we had it part of our book club at Zaytuna College, Strangers in Their Own Land. Why did the Tea Party emerge? And primarily older Caucasian Americans who feel or who are increasingly resentful because immigrants who are getting government assistance cut the line. Who's helping us? Who's helping us? And that resentment grows until it becomes the foundation of a political movement. What do, we, what do we Muslims see as one of the foundations of our society, of our politics? Those who inhabited their land, those Ansar who were there in Medina first, well iman, and they gained faith. So again, faith is central. 
يحبون من هاجر إليهم. They love those who migrated to them. So love is important. America will never be great until all of us love each other. Even if it's at a basic fundamental human level. Because we recognize all of us, Muslim, Jews, Christians, atheists, Hindu, Buddhists, all of us have been ennobled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have ennobled the human being. Are we allowed to mutilate people in a battlefield like Hamza, radiallahu anhu, who was mutilated? Can Muslims then turn around and do that to people who aren't Muslim? No, we can't. Why can't we? Because even that dead non-Muslim person has a basic dignity afforded to him or her by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their creator. And that human dignity can't be violated by mutilating their corpse. So if at a, just a basic fundamental human level, we can show that we love people, that we care about their well-being. يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي شُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا And they find no agitation in their hearts over what others were given. We're saying they're cutting the line. They're getting food stamps from my tax dollars. You're getting Medicare, Medicaid from your tax dollars? Tax breaks? That's besides the point. But resentment over what others are given. Why are we spending millions, not billions, millions of dollars on WIC? Women and infants and children. Women, infants, and children. Why are they getting discount on milk? No one's giving me discount. I work hard. What is, the, what is the foundation of the Muslim community? They find no agitation in their hearts based on what others are given. And they give preference to others. They let them take it. I would prefer they have it. Even though they themselves were suffering from poverty. I do need it, but they need it more. I do need it, but I'm a single guy. They have children. Those kids need this. I can survive. This is what we can teach our country at this very critical and crucial time. Or we can allow the division, the hatreds, the bitterness, the resentment, that has been exacerbated by what happened on September 11, 2001 to fester until it grows and becomes malignant and spreads throughout our body politic and threatens the very foundation of our union. The choice in terms of what we do as a community, that choice is ours, brothers and sisters. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us to make the right choice. Blesses us to make the courageous choice. Blesses us to make the morally and ethically sound choice. Bless us to make the choice that will be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord. So may Allah ta'ala bless you. May Allah ta'ala bless SBIA. May Allah ta'ala bless all of you for taking time from your at the end of a very busy week, you're tired and you could be home unwinding and relaxing, but you chose to come here. May Allah Ta'ala bless you for that and reward you. We pray that what we mentioned can be of some benefit to you. And as they say, Ila Liqa until we meet again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.